So this also was a, a lot of fun. You can tell uh, I have experimented a bit with uh, both the style and how the robot and I work together. In this video, I'm showing you how I combine my passions for electronics and painting into one project where I made an art robot. Now, the whole concept is how we work together as man and machine to create something completely new. This video is brought to you by JLC PCB, where you can create your own custom PCBs for as little as $2. Upload your Gerber files today to get an instant price quote and start manufacturing. The robot drew all of the outlines and then I painted in with uh, acrylic paint. And then I made the robot take another pass, filling in all the details. This is actually a process pretty similar to how Andy Warhol did it in his silk screens, where he first printed in colored areas and then he did a final printing mask with all of the details lost. However, I did get some ideas on how to improve the process. So here's a highlight reel from the development process. The stepper driver got so hot it actually melted uh, part of my breadboard. So these uh, silent stepper drivers have uh, tiny bridges uh, that you can solder to select different communication modes. To make the canvas holder push more against the canvas when the marker is drawing, I have decided to 3D print some new motor holders. I actually have a new problem with the silent set of drivers. Because you see these lines that the robot has drawn behind me? With the old noisy stepper drivers, these lines used to be completely straight. And right now you can see they sort of have this uh, break point in the middle and I spent most of yesterday troubleshooting, debugging to get these lines straight. The problem was not in the circuit but in the software. The draw head on the robot is dependent on gravity helping by pulling on the draw head so it can move precisely downwards and upwards. For the first draw head I used four power banks that I taped together. Now that I move on to a more polished version I wanted to cast the weights in plaster of Paris. So I did some calculations to find the density of the plaster by first measuring a given volume and then just placing it on a kitchen scale. When I had found the density I could use this to find what volume I needed for a given weight. I also made a couple of cylinders to act as a side weight for the robot. So I have just received the PCBs that I designed for the robot and uh, this is something I've been looking forward to for a while because it means I can take all of this mess, all of the uh, slightly unreliable and uh, temporary connections and wires and make them into one more robust package. So let's get on to soldering.
Now take a look at this. Here is where the power jack is going to be. And as I put in into the mounting holes, you can see that the silk screen is slightly off. This means the power jack was more to the one side than I had estimated. So I can still push it inside, but it's going to be a little crooked. But that doesn't really matter as long as it sits as strong as it needs to and I have all the electrical connections. printed these flexible holders. They simply snap onto the PCB and then I can slide them onto the rail. with uh, the robot out of the way and ready to be mounted. This means I can finally get rid of all of this mess that I have uh, just used to support the, uh, the robot and the prototyping and uh, everything while I worked on it. I have this idea that I want to mount it on top of this shelf with the robot sticking out on either side. So the way I was planning on mounting the robot is that I have this shelf plate that I'm putting on the top of the main shelf. And the robot is going to be mounted along the edge, just like it was on my main desk. But to do that, I need to shave or saw off a strip of material on either end so that I can get the clamps in between. This is not a straight line at all. <laughs> this cut looks so terrible. But it works. I'm painting the edges here to uh, sort of mask the edge. So this <laughs> terrible cut won't be as visible. I'm adding these strips of cork to dampen the vibrations coming from the robot frame. This will hopefully mean that it transfers less noise into the main shelf which is also situated to my uh, bedroom wall actually. I would prefer if I uh, could run the robot overnight without having to listen to it. I usually use these command strips to hang up my paintings and pictures on the wall. These are basically like a strong set of velcro that are fastened one side to the wall and the other side to the painting by some double-sided tape here. I'm going to fasten the plate by using these kinds of clamps on the edge of the shelf. However, this creates a pivot point where the shelf, because they are only fastened in this area, not behind here, they can pivot forward. So the shelf needs to be attached on the back as well. This is where I'm going to use these kinds of uh, command strips. Now I'm going to need a super long USB cable or actually a short USB cable and four <laughs> long USB extensions to get from the robot and the robot control board over to my computer. To prepare the robot I attach the belts with weights onto the motors at the corners at the robot. I then aim the center nut in the draw head onto this little bullseye. 
That way I know and more importantly the robot knows it's in the home position and from this point it can calculate exactly how it's going to move. I then attach a permanent marker onto the draw head and it decides when to draw and when to just move in a white line by flipping this tiny robot arm up and down. To attach a canvas I just use this wooden frame that I got from another canvas just by cutting off the fabric. I then clamp this together before I take the whole canvas assembly and clamp onto the robot frame itself. So the way this all works is that the draw head naturally wants to push against the canvas. But when the robot arm moves up, because the draw head is pushing against the canvas, the tip of the permanent marker gets pushed against the canvas as well and it begins to draw. Now the side motors can send precise pulses to the pulleys and decide if the belt is going to let loose or pull up. This can all be compared to having a rope with a weight in the middle of it where we can control where the weight goes by pulling on the rope fastened to the corners of a square or a canvas or whatever. That way it can precisely move how the draw head is going to actually draw onto the canvas. And how is the robot controlled? Well, I'm glad you asked. I've split the workload between my computer and the brains of the robot, which is the PCB. The way it works is that the computer sends a command to the robot over USB. This is a line the robot is going to move. And then the robot calculates how it's going to move there by remembering its exact position at this point, where it's going to go and how to pulse the motors to get there. I've written some code in C Sharp, which allows me to launch a graphical window with a lot of different options to control the robot. Here I can connect over USB and then send different commands to either move the tiny servo up or down. And I can select different pictures, set their uh, position value and then slice it into different uh, lines for the robot to move. This is heavily inspired by how 3D printers work. We can actually preview from this slider. Here you can see the uh, red line are the different lines the robot moves either by drawing or moving. Or we can just press this button to send the image to the robot and start drawing everything from left to right. Here we can also see the current line the robot is drawing. I will make all of this code available on GitHub so you can use the program if you want to. And I will also publish a separate.exe file so that you can run the graphical interface without installing C Sharp and loading the code in the background. So what happens when the robot has finished drawing? Take a look at this. I made the robot draw all of the details in the first layer. What I did was to use regular acrylic paint and then medium to thin it so it became more transparent. This meant I could paint the yellow over the black details and still preserve most of the black and most of the details. One drawback I noticed, the permanent marker from the robot, as it moved across the textured canvas, the tip became worn, which gives this uh, artifact you can see. So what I did was to simply angle the marker, so it's 30 degrees in relation to the canvas. So this is the third painting me and the robot did together. Here you can see much more clearly how I have used paint on top of the black detail mask. You can see how the lines at this point, the details become much tighter. And I did a change during this painting. Onto the draw hand, I just taped a piece of foam, which meant it didn't wobble around anymore, or at least much less, which is why uh, all of the details became much more overlapping here and also tighter or smaller. 
for this most recent painting. I just started with a completely orange painting and then made the robot do its work after I had uh, made a photo in Photoshop. It was a lot of fun because I experimented with half tones. So actually there are four levels or four tones in this painting. We have the black and we have the orange which is like at either side of the spectrum. And then we have two half tones in between. And now for my favorite part of the video, I get to explain how the math behind the robot works. So the main questions we want answered are the number of steps that the two motors are going to move, as well as the movement ratio between them. So if we take a look at the point in the middle here, we can actually see that the two belts for the robot are two Pythagoras hypotenuses. That means if we are going to move the robot to another point, let's say down here, we are going to need to move the hypotenuses, which is the two robot belts. So we already know the x values and y values of the first and second point. Those are our inputs. So let me just mark where points are so we can see it a bit better. Now with the y values, we know how far down the point is located. And with the x values, we know how far from the top left it is located. So this means we can solve the left half of the Pythagoras problem. To solve the right half, we just take another known value, which is the width of the robot minus the x value, which means this value right here is equivalent to the width minus x1. Now we have another constant we need to consider, which is the increase in the hypotenuse. That is how much the belt length either increases or decreases based on the rotation from the uh, motors. So I set this as the rotation length. Now this actually means we have all the values we need to calculate both end steps and the motor ratio. Now because this point is moving downwards and to the right, we know the biggest difference in the two belt lengths or the hypotenuses are in the left side. So let's just name these two. We have the uh, left hypotenuse and we have the right hypotenuse. Now we are interested in the delta or the change in these two hypotenuses. And that's just a simple subtraction. Now to get the maximum number of steps being moved by the left motor when the left hypotenuse increase is larger than the right hypotenuse increase, we just simply divide the difference in the hypotenuse by the length moved by each pulse from the motor and we have our number of steps being moved as a maximum. Now to trigger the other motor, we simply do a uh, division where we take the right hypotenuse increase divided by the left hypotenuse increase. And there we have our motor ratio. So the way we handle this in code is to simply give the new point the robot is going to move to and it remembers its current position. It then uses Pythagoras to calculate the difference in the hypotenuses, checks which one one is going to move the furthest and then it starts pulsing first the steps to the motor that's going to move the longest and then it just triggers based on this threshold when the other motor is going to pulse as well. If you'd like to create your own robot I have written detailed build instructions linked in the video description. There you can also find all the downloadable files for the 3D printing and the code that I made for this project. And if you're interested in seeing some more of the art that we have made and will make in the future, I have also created an Instagram account, which is linked down below.